I used to manage a bar in a nightclub in Deptford. And Lawrence helped run the bar and that's where I met him, across a bar, ironically enough. <laughs> But at that time, that was the social scene. Everyone, you know, you worked in a club, you went out in London, there was a lot of booze around and young, free, single, that's, that's how things were, you know. It wasn't till getting married and settling down with kids that everything settled down, but he didn't. <laughs> he carried on, you know. It took me a good four or five years to realise that he had a problem. He couldn't have a night in without four or five and it was the strong stuff you know and after a while I started thinking mm, I think we've got a bit of a problem here when I'm drinking I never really sort of count the units as it were I never really think about that if I'm going out then I'll drink more um, if I'm just going to the pub I'll only have a couple of pints. It's a great ritual isn't it? You come home and you hear that and that bottle beckons to you and then you, you know, it's kind of, what do you do with that time between 7.30 and 8 if you don't do that? And you have to kind of get past that hump, you know, so I try to limit my drinking. I won't get drunk very often at all, uh, but with my friends like and my sister's friends, like they have had to go to hospital because they've had kidney infections due to the amount of alcohol they drank and, and they're still carrying on drinking. So I don't, I don't understand that, to be honest, because it does wreck your body at the end of the day. I mean, like 22, we need our body for another at least 60 years. Even in quite low amounts uh, can increase the risks of some diseases. For example, if a woman drinks a bottle of wine a week, which is well within recommended uh, safe limits, uh, that's about half um, a woman's weekly uh, upper limit, if you like, uh, that increases her risk of breast cancer by about 10%. So uh, there's no such thing as a safe limit, and therefore to, to differentiate use and misuse, use and abuse, is in a sense not a particularly helpful concept. very very intelligent and uh, very arty and his father got him into a, an apprenticeship in an architect's office and he was doing quite well there and then he went out one lunchtime and met some friends that worked on a removal van I said we're going up to Scotland and he went okay and off he went and jacked everything and he was about 16 17 uh, obviously came back and he was sacked father went mad and threw him out so at 16 he came down to London and just fell in with a boozy crowd and I think it started early on and this rejection from parents. So I think um, he had a lot of hang-ups that he found quite difficult to vocalise really. So he internalised it and drunk because he was a different person with a drink. He was fun gregarious, outgoing, whereas without a drink he was quite reserved. If you didn't really know him, you wouldn't probably know he was drunk. He wasn't a falling down drunk, but I got to know a look that he used to get in his eyes to know that he'd had a drink, because he'd drink vodka so you couldn't smell it. People will accept a happy drunk more than a nasty one, because they're just fun to be with and a bit daring and a bit out there. I think it was how he wanted to be all the time, but drink brought that out in him. Sometimes I come and sit in the park with a couple of cans and uh, watch the world go by. I think it's a, it's a good way to, um, to sort of relax, to meet people. Everyone's a bit more you know, lively, keen to meet people, keen to have a good time. It just gives you a you know, feeling of confidence. It makes you, in all fairness, enjoy a night out arguably more. It is, to me, synonymous with relaxing and pleasure. And, you know, it just, it isn't the same if you say, well, thank you very much, I'll have a Coke. I don't know, it just uh, takes you into another world. All out here, there's so much pressures on everybody. 
to do this, do that. And then to just go in the pub, put all them worries behind you for a few hours. It's just enjoyable. He would be sober for weeks and then go missing for three days. And you never knew when it, and he never knew when it was going to hit. And then he got done for drink driving. So he lost his licence and he couldn't get to work. And he got banned, it's two, three years. So he got a job. He was a operating theatre porter. And they had a social club with cheap booze. Oh, we've got a drink policy here. Yeah, the drink policy was <laughs> give them cheap booze. Filled with doctors, nurses, all the hospital staff, all getting nicely tanked after a 48 hour shift or something. Eventually got his licence back and he, w he went through a phase where he was keeping it under control. He, he was never of the opinion that he could, he would have to abstain completely. He always thought he wanted to get it to a point where he could have a sociable drink and then leave it, which obviously wasn't the case with him. He wouldn't go to AA, he didn't like group meetings, he felt self-conscious getting up and saying, hi, I'm Lawrence, I'm an alcoholic, and all the rest of it. So he did one-to-one, -one, and he had a counsellor there that he seemed to click with. But he even went to hypnotist because he thought if he could find the stem of what made him do it, it, it would be part of the cure. He'd come out of work, he'd go to an off-licence, he'd buy sweets for the kids, he'd buy cigarettes, and not even contemplate buying a drink. And this would go on for weeks and then suddenly he'd walk in and buy a bottle of vodka and he didn't know why that happened. It was, it was something in his life that he was desperate to find out what the trigger was that made him do that, really. I think smoking has been a very good example where the profession medical profession and allied professions have taken the lead and I think we need to do the same with alcohol. That doesn't mean to say that doctors need to st stop drinking but I think they, d they do lead by example but also I think they have to take the opportunity of making every contact count. So I think doctors have a big role. I mean I've got teenage, late teenage boys and I think the girls drink much more than the boys do. When girls come round they, they they just, they usually come with a bottle and they certainly mm. seem to, to drink more and they smoke and I think drinking and smoking kind of go hand in hand. Men used to drink so much more than women but then, but now women have kind of said I'll, I'll show you how to drink and they've gone worse, they're worse than fellas, especially young girls. Girls yeah, are like 17, 18, 19, you've fallen all over the curbs and stuff. I think it's very tempting to concentrate on young people and there's a reason for that obviously. Well if you can get children early uh, then and, and, and stop uh, getting into the habits of binge drinking and so on. But it's also, I think, convenient because it makes the rest of us think it's somebody else's problem, not our own. And we know that alcohol is being used and misused right across the age spectrum. People's perception of what an alcoholic is, some down and out, sat in the curbside, you know, lost his home, lost everything. Whereas it is prevalent in so many different parts of society, regardless of class, age, race, religion, whatever. I think it's not recognised as one of the biggest diseases out there, really. I dreaded Christmas. It was an excuse to get loads of booze in, in case people come round. It was for him. We went on holiday to Mallorca, cheap booze everywhere. I might, I might as well have gone on my own because he was just laid out on a sunbed. He'd say, you know, I'm just going for a little walk to see if there's anywhere we can take the kids and that'd be it. You wouldn't, he'd be in a bar somewhere or... So all the things that families enjoy together became sort of a dread of mine because you just knew it was another excuse to seek it out. It's, an Ill, it's a terrible illness, it really is. When he was working at the hospital, he worked shift work, so quite often he'd do a night, come home and sleep. 
quite often he'd have a night off, get tanked up, come home and sleep. So with the kids, I'd say, Dad's been at work, keep quiet. So they weren't really aware. And if he was awake, he'd be rolling around the floor, playing with them, giving them piggybacks, because it was this big fun persona that he took on. I knew he was drunk, but they probably didn't have a clue, really. Maybe if I had recognised what was going on earlier. But I think I was just so much in love with him. I didn't want I didn't want it to be a problem. I just wanted him, oh, stop it. Don't have another one. What's wrong with you? You know, but then it got to a point to hide it from me. He would go out. He'd take the dog for a walk. He's taken the dog for a walk, come back, took the dog off the lead and hit the floor out cold where he's done a half bottle of vodka while he's been out. The real life side of it, you know, I've actually liquidised food and fed it to him because he's had the DT so bad and the sweats and yeah. When I was a child, my parents would, would go out for a, you know, a dinner dance or something twice a year. They'd have friends round twice a year and there would be alcohol on those occasions, but it wasn't a weekly or even monthly uh, happening. Wine was, was what my parents drank. It was a, a glass of wine with a meal, very much like the European culture. So as children, when we got into our teens, we were introduced to wine by having a very watery drink with a little drop of wine in. And as we gradually got older, that would, that would become a little bit more wine in it until we got to 16, 17, and then we were actually allowed a, a proper glass of wine. And my parents had this attitude that introduce it very slowly and, and, and get us to be responsible. When we used to go to like family dinners or family parties, my dad would always let me have like sometimes a shandy or try a bit of a wine. I think it's good to introduce it when they're early age instead of like having it as no, no, you can't touch this until like 18 and then they end up binge drinking. It's a bit like having McDonald's and not allowed it and then all of a sudden you want it all the time because it's like, ooh, forbidden. I know it's very nice and, and uh, to think well, let's uh, give our children a little bit of wine and, 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 and water from an early age, but in a sense that's normalising drinking. How we renorm alcohol in society I think is one of our biggest challenges. Then he got down a second time, drink driving, with the kids in the car hit a pedestrian who ended up through the front window in the front seat. The kids were in the back. And he hadn't had a drink, but he was tanked up the night before and he was still over the limit. Go and pick the kids up. I pulled up, Laura's in a bright yellow sundress, covered in blood. And it wasn't her, it was where Lawrence, because there was no seatbelt law there. Then, and he'd hit the um, steering wheel and had this big nosebleed but picked her up but I can still see that yellow dress with the black, thinking it was her and he got six months in Ford I'm working, I've got two kids I've got him there but for six months he didn't drink and I thought maybe this will crack it so yeah, he came out of there and for a good two months I thought this is it, We've, we're on the right road and then missing again. And he was just distraught, absolutely distraught after that because he just, he thought he'd cracked it as well but it just, you know, happened to be in a situation and started and that was the next binge, so. For me as a wine drinker as well as winemaker, and put, put myself here as a wine drinker, I like to go out and I like to buy a decent bottle of wine and I, you know, me and my husband will enjoy a glass, maybe two glasses a night maximum, and they're small glasses. I, I'm not abusing it, I'm doing it to enjoy a product as, as much as I would to enjoy a really good meal. A glass of wine is something to be savoured, something to be enjoyed. First of all, alcohol is not an ordinary commodity and it can't be left to individual choice. It can't be wrapped up in lifestyle like designer jeans. I mean, I don't believe government should tell us what to do at all, but I have to acknowledge mm. that most people, some people, um, aren't very 
good, yeah. you know, and if drink is incredibly cheap and incredibly widely available, then it is, it is an issue. I think alcohol should be much more expensive. The young people, they, they buy it in bulk so much. They, drinks they don't need, but because it's cheap, they think, oh, I'll buy three of them. I think most people can drink responsibly, <laughs> and so they should have the choice of if they want high quality stuff or they want cheap stuff. We can't just leave it up to the individual and say it's for them to choose. Uh, it requires action on those three main levers, and those levers are price, uh, availability, and marketing, so that we can live in a society where people can drink if they choose to, but they're not being bombarded with those messages and the availability at petrol stations and the drink in the supermarkets at pocket money prices. It's tough all round, really, and then eventually we've been together 13 years and he started seeing one of the uh, switchboard girls at the hospital and it's like, I've put up with this for 13 years and you think you can start? And that was the final straw, it was like, no, enough. He was my soulmate, I loved him to bits and I was desperate to see him right, but that was like a kick in the teeth, so we split. And it didn't work out with her, but he got his own place. And we were best mates because I only saw him when he was sober. So that period of time was probably the best time that we had as a couple, although we were apart. Now, although I didn't miss him, I didn't miss all the hassle. I think his binges have got worse. And eventually they put him on antidepressants. I got a knock on the door one night about 10 o'clock from one of his friends and uh, bottle of vodka and the whole lot gone. End of story. So it killed him in the end. And Laura was about um, 13 and John was 10. I think that was the worst part of it really with them. You'd go through anything rather than put your kids through it. And, and, and I even get angry now because John will be playing in a band somewhere and Laura's doing well at work and I think, you bloody fool, this is, this would have been your time. This is when you would have been, he loved them as kids, but as adults, he would have been in his element. I would say to him, you're gonna lose your family. You're gonna lose, you know, if you keep drinking like this, we're gonna split up. You're gonna lose your home, everything that you value because you want to have a drink and yet they still make that choice. That's how strong the addiction is because I don't doubt for a minute that he did, you know, that he didn't love me. I, I know that he loved me. I know that he loved his children. I know that he had great friendships and relationships with people, and yet that bottle won over before anything. <laughs> <laughs>